Welcome to the Inflation Nation Battle Plan. I'm Danny Ratliff here with Richard Rossa with RIA Advisors. We are Clarity Financial. Get through a little housekeeping first. Doing business as RIA Advisors, a registered investment advisor with the Securities Exchange Commission. Please keep in mind any of this information today should not be construed as a recommendation, but just some tips or things for you to think about as far as what is your battle plan and what you guys should be doing to help your household and uh, keep more money in your pocket. So before we really jump into the definition of inflation, which I'm sure many of you already know now, uh, if you didn't before, you, you do at this moment. But inflation is when you pay $15 for the $10 haircut they used to get for $5 when you had bad hair. This is from Sam Ewing. Now, Rich, kind of funny when you think about it uh, or not. But it's true. It hits right to the heart of your daily expenses, right? Because people are rethinking their household budgets, right? Because Or thinking twice about their budget. Or they're thinking three times about how to spend their money. So we are seeing a change in habits. And I will tell you, this inflation phenomenon, you didn't need to be an economist, Danny, to see it coming, right? We've talked about it that we had very accommodative monetary policy. And we also then threw fuel on the fire with a second stimulus check. So, and we had the personal savings rate well above double digit, well into the double digits because people didn't do anything. So you had all this money. And what is inflation really is too many dollars chasing too few goods, right? So demand pull inflation is when consumers experience upward price pressures that follow a supply shortage, ding, 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 <laughs> right? But it's a tax, right, Danny? We all feel it. But lower and middle class households really bear the brunt of this. We've seen it. We've read about it. We've heard people's commentary. And listen, it's painful for everybody, but the lower and middle class really feel, feel it, especially with food and energy prices. Well, that's right. So, you know, what has sparked the inflationary cycle? I think there's a there's a number of things. It's really the perfect storm. You know, we had the pandemic, which, you know, we shut down supply chains. We also gave a lot of money out. So fiscal monetary policy was very loose. You know, we made arguments, Rich, that we need to be more deliberate as far as what these stimulus checks look like. But mm -hmm. not only did we give these checks out, we also told people, don't worry about paying your discretionary expenses. And so what happens? You don't need to pay your rent, your mortgage, your student loan debt. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? You're going to go out and spend the money. And so that's exactly what happened. And so, like you said, you have, um, you know, you have the demand there, but not the supply. So now we we couple that on top of a poor energy policy, at least for from an inflationary perspective. Correct. correct? You've got a food disruption mm -hmm. from a drought, uh, the war in Ukraine, geopolitical issues are, are certainly there, and the tensions have risen. Mm -hmm. So you know, we've got a lot of things that have changed. The Great Resignation, a, another big factor where people yep. have said, hey, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna do things a little bit differently now. We think that some of these things and, and um, these pressures, they're going to subside over time. I mean, it's going to naturally come down. But also with what the Fed's doing, that's going to make that's going to change things a little bit as well. Talking about the Fed, though, what about this transitory thesis they've had? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, we've seen we saw the M2 money stock really explode here uh, along with CPI. And <clears throat> it is a monetary phenomenon. Now, there have been studies in the past that showed that M2 really didn't lead to inflation, right? There were some rules that absolutely broke down these long-term economic tenets that didn't really work uh, through the pandemic. And we're, we're starting to see that now. Um, now we're also starting to see money supply contract, but CPI has been or consumer price index has absolutely been very stubborn, right, Danny? We've seen, um, you know, we've seen somewhat of a cooling off, but not enough to where to, to, to say to you, you're not going to get burned uh, by inflation. So, and then the Fed came along with this transitory thesis and they fell way, way behind. You know, Danny, I always talk about this on the radio show that the time the Fed really should have at least started pulling back emergency measures was when that second fiscal stimulus package came out and to know that why are we still doing this the economy was recovering and the fed should have really acted then in other words like a lever when the when the fiscal policy got looser the monetary policy should have gotten stricter but it was a very lackadaisical sort of 
I don't know. I it's just like a big black hole. I think. Danny, well, it's just the throwing a big net out, right? Right. And, and just saying, hey, look what we're doing. We're helping all these people. Well, really, it just made the problem even worse. And so, you know, we talk about where does inflation go from here? And I right. think it's always transitory. So, I mean, it's a little bit disingenuous when we talk about inflation. That oh, is it is it going to be permanent? Well, it's never just sitting in one spot. Now, unless <laughs> you the yeah. prior decade where we couldn't get it to, to you know past two percent. Um, so, you know, one, some of the things that we we're looking at is the stronger dollar should make it easier for imported goods. Um, current wages are certainly not keeping up with that. And so we hear a lot of stories or say, listen, I lived through the seventies and eighties and this is very similar. Well, there's a lot of things that are much different. The economy is much different. We're much more manufacturing. We had one of the largest demographics going from a baby boomers that were going into the workforce or going into peak earnings years. And now they're, they've left or they're in the middle of that. So, Things are much different. Plus, we're a service industry. Now, we're estimating that inflation's going to decline over time. And we think we're hoping that we're, we've seen it peak. Now, maybe we haven't. Um, you know, I think that we're beginning to see a lot of things, though, that would suggest that's the case, Rich. We've mm-hmm. heard a lot of companies. So right now, we're smack dab in the middle of earnings season once again. Mm-hmm. And even last quarter, we were hearing from Procter & Gamble CFO saying, listen, we did several price hikes last year. We don't think we're going to continue to be able to pass that on to the consumer. Right. So it's going to begin hurting our profit margins. And we're beginning to hear a lot more of that that type of conversation. Mm-hmm. And so I think that that's going to be one thing that is, you know, Lance has always mentioned uh, on, on the radio show or at realinvestmentadvice.com. Inflation, the cure for inflation is higher inflation. And that's exactly what we're seeing in some it ways. It is. It is. And absolutely, to Danny's point, um, we are estimating inflation to drop. But I will tell you, it's still going to be painful here. Um, the Fed's 2% nebulous target who knows when that's going to be achieved? They're saying 2024, but we look at that in a, in a skeptical manner. So what is the new baseline? Well, we use in our financial plans 25 to 3%, and that's why we adjusted inflation in financial plans early on accordingly. Because, again, this 2% target is a bit nebulous. But I will tell you, when you're in this inflation storm, it's very tough for most consumers to see the, the sun or see the end of it. And our job is to really look at things objectively. And you have to remember, demand destruction is happening as, you know, wage growth is roughly 5.6% and you are seeing inflation anywhere from 8 to 10. There's, it's just a matter of time. And we are seeing cash coffers start to drain. Uh, we don't have the savings rate nowhere near what we had uh, during the pandemic. So there is going to be demand destruction. We've already seen uh, GDP estimates fall second quarter, right? Uh, they're going to... now. This um, is about 1.6%, negative 1.5, 1.6. So inflation will subside. The issue is, though, when does it, or if it does, fall to the Fed's 2% target? Your guess is as good as ours. My guess is no, Danny. And I don't think it's 2024. It might be more like 2026 before we see that. And now inflation has been... Um, heading in the right direction, but I will tell you, it's like, uh, you know, inflation is uh, s- sort of sticking you, but now it's not going to stick you as hard, but you're still going to feel it, right? It's not like it's going to drop off dramatically, you know, because consumers are still spending, Danny. People are still spending, but this is going to start to drain uh, over time. Well, I think especially if we see higher rates and if that stays elevated for some time, mm-hmm. it's going to become more and more difficult for households to, to spend that same type of money. I mean, we've looked at studies that show that the average household spending about $6,000 in debt each year right. just to keep up with their current standard of living. Correct. That is problematic. Um, you know, we are heading in the right direction, but, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those deals where the Fed had a very difficult time for the last 10 years, really since the Great Recession. They've been trying to get to that 2% target. Well, now we had to create a pandemic here to actually have, okay, well, we're well above that now. Mm-hmm. How do we get it back to it? I don't know. I mean, they, they haven't had a whole lot of success prior. I'm not sure why we're going to think they have a whole lot on the other end. That's true. Now, at RIA, we do spend a lot of time. Maybe Mr. Powell should spend some time with his own Fed's research, but the Atlanta Fed does a great job with inflation studies. I read them all. So it helps us in our planning as well. And there's something called sticky price index. And these are prices that change relatively slowly. It's something that the Fed really should focus on. But as of this presentation or this uh, chart, 
It was 7.1% on an annualized basis. I will tell you that has conti- in April, that has continued to go higher. That's very concerning because to Danny's point earlier, it doesn't look like exactly inflation has peaked yet. So it's still moving higher on the sticky prices. And on sticky prices, that's where we need to be uh, concerned. So we're going to watch this very carefully. Danny, I think for us, our challenge is going to be where does inflation go for our clients next year in our financial plans? What does that look like? I can't tell you yet. I, I, I need more data to look at it in January to say will we increase our baseline inflation and inflation for many goods. Danny, we have seen, which is positive, we've seen housing prices come down. We've seen less, still a seller's market, but a little bit less of that, mm-hmm. right? We've seen that. We've seen retail sales come down a bit. We've seen car sales come down a bit. So we are seeing what Lance talks about in demand destruction. It's just not fast enough for everybody to uh, deal with it in their household and still feel good. Well, some of this da- data is lagging, right? I mean, if you look at the home prices, we look at a lot of this information that we get in and it's priced into uh, CPI. It's, it's much different in the sense of some of this is so far behind that yes. we may get a much different story here in another couple of months. Right. Now you can see, and it, and it does come out in what we call animal spirits. Consumer confidence is at the lowest level since 2013 per the University of Mich- Michigan's confidence gauge. So this is Americans' distress. Now think about this. The markets and how our economy works sometimes has nothing to do with numbers. I mean, numbers are important, but it's the animal spirits. If I feel good, I spend more. And you can see where inflation is a very top priority of concern for most of the country, right? 70% uh, said it's a very big problem when you see climate change and some of these other issues really toward the bottom, right? So inflation, and of course, that does affect the affordability of healthcare as well, because even in our models, right, Danny, healthcare inflation is up more than the, the traditional average, and we keep track of that very closely for financial plans. So we wanted to, what Danny and I wanted to do, an RIA, is create a battle plan for you. I am sure, because you have been in battle, you have a plan. But there may be some things that you haven't thought of. And that's why we did this lunch. We're doing this lunch alarm. We want you to know there are things that we are learning from our clients. And we go, huh, that's a really good idea. And we're going to pass those on to you. First of all, right, Danny? No magic elixir. It's a creative process. It's unique for each household. Well, everybody's household's a little bit different. You spend money on different things than I would with having small children right now. People's travel habits have changed. Yep. You know, we're, we're finding that people are you know, fairly intuitive in the sense of when we get into a bear market or recession, people typically pull back. Uh, we're having higher inflation. It's hitting the pocketbook in certain ways. They're saying, hey, instead of doing things one way, we can do it <laughs> this way. Or maybe you just defer and you wait. And we're going to talk a little bit, bit about that too. But we're hearing so many good stories, so many great ideas. And- Many of these things, though, Rich, they're not easy, but it's just one of those deals where you say, hey, we're going to weather this storm. Here's how we're going to do it. Here's what it looks like on the other side. So right. just sharing those tips with you guys today. And keep in mind, some of these things, the opportunity is past, right? We're going to talk about some things that mm-hmm. are really good ideas in certain types of environments. But if we are peaking, maybe these mm-hmm. are some ideas that mm-hmm. we want to say, hey, great idea. Maybe we don't want to use at the moment, though. Well, but I will tell you, uh, just to push back a little bit, I think a lot of these ideas can be used going forward because the best time to prepare for a storm is when there's sunshine, right? So we want to make sure that these are things that you can continue to use to make your household leaner, meaner financially. And the first step is to know what your personal CPI is, and you can do it. There's a My CPI tool that captures the uniqueness of your selection of goods and individual purchases. I'm signed up for it. There's like 144 different market baskets that can yield you a closer approximation to your cost of living. You go to atlantafed.org and complete the quick analysis. You may be surprised on how your house... What was your most recent? Oh, mine was like 7.5% inflation, and it used to be something like 1.5 to 2.5. I'm sure yours, Danny, is probably 300 basis points above mine. I haven't done with, it in a minute. Last time I did, I want to say it was 6.7. Uh-huh, but I'm, I bet but if you I do it now, you'll see it's, it. it's yeah. higher. 
right? And if, so households with children, uh, older, older Americans spending more on health care, all going to make a difference, right? You want to consider micro budgeting. I will tell you, this is the true reveal. This is the DNA of your cash flow. This is like almost like, do you ever see those machines that spit out dollars and they're fast? I'm telling you to slow this household cash machine down. As Rich, you, you, you just said a four-letter word, though, I budget. Said, I mean, oh, nobody oh, wants to do budget. Now you want micro-budgeting? I, I thought Brent was going to yell at me for saying a four-letter. I, I have a lot of four-letter words I can use in this presentation, but I'm not. This is taking your finances down to a very granular level, down to what you spend on a daily basis. What that is going to do is going to detect these unnecessary expenditures, including these very sneaky auto subscriptions. Right, I would tell you to avoid technology, even though people use it, but to track using a pen and a notebook, right, your daily spends for one month. You might be very surprised where you can cut. Now, there's regular budgeting, and then there's the DNA cellular level of budgeting. And that's what this micro budgeting is. You go down to the dollars you're spending every day. And I have people that do this, Danny, and they have saved thousands of dollars, especially capturing auto subscriptions that have been, I had one client go, oh my gosh, I've been paying for Norton antivirus for five years and I don't even have that computer anymore. Oh my goodness. $1,500. And she was still paying for it and they called, they said they might be nice and re rebate her back a year or two, but there's no assurance. So you've got to go down to this level. This is a... A uh, habit that I hope you keep once inflation is down to a much more reasonable level. Well, right? Rich, I mean, I think that, you know, there's so many good things you can take from this. And I think uh -huh. using technology is still great in many ways. I mean, a lot of people will use Mint or aggregators to kind of keep everything in one spot. They look at QuickBooks, but it becomes more real. And, and most people that are doing that are probably doing okay already because they see it, they're looking at it, they're updating it on a regular <laughs> right. basis. But when you start putting the pin to pad, it becomes a, low, a whole lot more real. And, and look, you need to do full disclosure here. I mean, you track everything on pin and pad. You have a budget, a journal. Yes, you do I this do. for not only um, you know looking at things like this to be granular, but Rich does such a great job. I got to brag on you that you do it with Christmas gifts. And I think this is genius I because do. you I say, do. hey, I spent this much on this person well, last year. I did year, much more, we, right? Yeah. I keep track of that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, oh boy, I spoiled this person next last year. Am I going to do it this year? They're getting cold. Maybe Brent. Maybe I spoiled, spoiled rent again. We'll see. So, I mean, this is a discipline. Like, and this is it why is. I'm, and this is something now, I wrote this candidly in April, May, this part of the presentation. But look, it's already working. If you stay put, if you don't need a replacement for an appliance or an automobile or a house, wait. There's a four-letter word I can say. Wait, right? We're not good at this. We're not good at delayed gratification, but it is the best solution, not only for building financial, your wealth over time, but for this battling inflation. Wait it out. If you need to purchase a durable, basic appliances, man, no bell, you know, why do I need a washer that serenades me at the end? I don't, right? What do I need an appliance to do, Work. right? Do you need lights, things? What do you need? Do you need designer colors? No. Can, can you do a little scratch and dent? Is that going to hurt you? I have people that have done that, Danny. I had a client that needed a new a washer dryer. I sent them to a place that does just plain vanilla. And there's, there's a, you know, it's scratched on the side and all that. I think for the pair, they paid $450 for Whirlpool. That's the funny thing, though. It's scratched on the side. something you're likely never going to see because it'll be up against the wall or up against the other appliance. Um, you know, and it, the door had a mark on it. Yeah. Who cares? I just need it to work. And now you can't even get a washer with an agitator. I mean, that's what everybody wants, right? And you're agitated about it. Yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> well, and, and now they don't work nearly as long. I mean, I think I had, you mean, the one, I, the, the washer I had prior to the one I have now is probably had for 20 years. And it was nothing really I, wrong with it. But, you know, when you got three kids, you do a whole lot more laundry. So. You need a little more room. I played in it. I play. I stayed in Airbnb recently, and I used the washer dry, and I think it serenaded me with Moon River at the end. Moon River. No, my clothes. My clothes were done. Who needs that? I need you to wash, and I need you to dry. Man, that's pretty snazzy. Where were you staying? Oh my gosh! You know we got an inflation, inflation, recession. I'm What's just saying, here, right? These people, you know, 
And then, listen, you want a car? I have people that do interim automobiles, late model, higher yeah. mileage, especially for short commutes as an interim solution, especially with this flexible work schedule. This has worked for many people, Danny, mm-hmm. where they're buying, you know, cars that have, you know, maybe 100,000 miles, but they don't go far every day. And until they get a new car, they're using these high mileage specials. You got to do your homework. That's right. right. You got it. You know, I would say you also have be somewhat proficient or know someone who's proficient with automobiles to check it out. But I have seen this work a little bit out, out of the box. I have seen this work with few households that say, hey, I'm going to wait because I really would like this truck or this, this SUV, but this is going to work for us just fine until we, um, we get through this. So, I have a friend who bought a little diesel automobile. Huh? 43 miles a gallon. Now he's pretty proficient with the, with cars, but you know, maybe not for everybody, but you can find those things and he didn't have to pay a whole lot. Right. Right. So wait and study, but wait's a good word. Now uh, I did a report with uh, channel two here in Houston KPRC to help a woman negotiate her credit card down. Now, listen, I'm going to tell you, this is not easy, but it works. Right. So we see credit card debt on the rise again as wages can't keep up with inflation. We're seeing people, consumers put more money, more, I mean, expenditures on credit cards and maintaining balances. Your average APRs are 16 percent. You know, that's just the average. Most of them fall within the 20 to 23 percent. Optimally, your balances should be paid off monthly. But for outstanding balances, listen, to what you could do, you can look at special balance transfer rates, go to creditcards.com. They'll, they'll help you find the best cards. Get through to the retention department of your current credit card issuer. Now, I will tell you, if you're in good standing with that card issuer and you're a tenured customer, you've been around a while, contact the card's customer service department, ask for a rate reduction. But I will tell you, you're going to have to be politely persistent. You're going to be told right up front, the company does not negotiate rates. Don't be discouraged. Keep going. Keep going. You're going to wear down that customer service representative, especially if you're polite and keep explaining why Mm -hmm. you need this done or maybe slightly threaten that you're going to have to move your business. And I've been with you for 10 years. And then unless the service advisor brings this up, and I did have this happen with KPRC where this large bank said, let us put you through to the retention department. But so usually it's just the thread even of saying, hey, you know what? That's fine. I understand it. I'm, I'm sorry. It's too bad. We've, we've worked together for a long time. I'm going a different direction. I've got X, Y, Z. But point. a lot Do of it. them say, well, we're sorry. But that's why I'm saying is you've yeah. got to be, don't hang up. And then some people are going to be highly uncomfortable with this. But you just be polite and keep going. I will tell you, you will probably get through the retention department. She was able to go ahead and negotiate a pretty good rate from the higher credit card rate. And she had been a good customer for close to a decade. So it can be done. It can be done. So step number five, you know, how do you make smart social security decisions? I think number one is you need to take the emotion out of it. You know, we just got new updates from the about the trust that it can go to 2035 before there's a reduction. And every time each year we're getting news and updates on it. And in fact, it's actually they prolonged. I mean, initially it was 2030, 2032 before there's a reduction in benefits. And now we're up to 2035. But Nonetheless, it's always concerning, and, and we do have concerns about it. There are so many people that rely on it, though, for a majority of their income that it's going to be very difficult for them to, to make any type of reduction. However, would you rather have a reduction in benefits from a higher amount or a lower amount? Higher, right? Of course. And so we run, we run the math here and uh, you know, look at it and say, what does that mean for you and your household long term? Now, Social Security is income that you can't outlive. Um, this is going to be guaranteed, guaranteed income for life. They're slated at the moment, you know, at the moment of when we put this down on paper, it was 8.6% inflation cost of living adjustment, the COLA adjustment. Now it's looking like it may be over 10%. Uh, we'll find out here, mm-hmm. um, October, uh, towards the end of the month. So one thing that we typically advise, and it's different for everybody, but if you can delay it past full retirement age, you get an 8% bump each and every year that you defer taking your benefits. So this can be really nice. So there are many instances, and this is why if you you ever listen to The Real Investment Show on YouTube, uh, we talk a lot about, Rich and I, about how to take Social Security, what's the best way to claim your benefits and keep the most money in your pocket. And waiting till 70 can certainly be a great option. Now, it's not for everyone. Some people need it uh, much sooner, depending on, you know, what's happened in life, where you are, 
uh, illnesses. I mean, everybody's got a little bit of a different moving target. So keep that in perspective. But, you know, we always talk about it starts with a plan and ends with a plan. This is certainly one of those cases where we want to make sure you maximize your Social Security and also think about it as it's not just a benefit for you, but for you and your family. So if you maybe, you know, we've talked, Rich, about how you have clients who, you know, they may be on their second marriage and their spouse is much younger or having children. Mm-hmm. Um, we also see, um, but you know, the breadwinner. Right. We want to make sure that they take this properly. So right. if they pass, their spouse gets that benefit. So this is a way that, you know, most pensions, they don't have an inflation rider associated with it. Social Security does, and that's what's really nice about it, that you will keep that up to hopefully keep up with inflation. That's right. And you're not, who's going to give you a cost of living adjustment equal to 8.6 to 10%? That's right. Nowhere, yeah. right? And my benefit at age 70 is going to be rather hardy based on the 8% annual retirement credit from full retirement age to age 70. This is a guaranteed lifetime income that you or you and your spouse or family cannot outlive. And I will tell you if, and we've all gone through, we're going through market turbulence right now, we might have a temporary bottom. But who knows how long it's going to take for stocks to recover without the Fed riding in on a white horse to save it. With inflation, the Fed has to battle that dragon first. So what you got to keep in mind is your guaranteed income products, your guaranteed income condos become much, much more important to your lifetime income strategy than your variable assets like stocks and bonds to what I think is going to be, uh, Danny, a turbulent cycle for variable assets like, again, stocks and bonds. Well, Rich, that's that's a good segue. Why don't we jump into what that looks like? How would you invest in this environment with mm -hmm. inflation for stocks? Well, think about it. We've seen it already. Stocks that increase their dividends may outperform. We've seen this this move uh, to value stocks versus growth stocks, or at least they've held up better. Now, we'll tell you, as of when I wrote this, natural resource stocks, agricultural commodities, materials, energy, had had a massive run-up. And now Mm -hmm. we have seen a lot of these commodity prices fall back. Remember, the market is looking ahead. So now it's looking at more of what might happen in recession, right? So we have seen a lot of these commodity stocks get battered. So maybe you've got a better entry point. But generally speaking, your natural resource stocks will do better during inflationary periods. But Stocks are overall more volatile when prices are rising since there's a point where, and Danny brought this up, companies can no longer pass on higher input costs to consumers. So the rule you have to keep in mind is follow the Fed. It's an aged but very effective Wall Street cliche. When rates are coming down, the market is definitely much more cooperative. And the storm of the, the Fed raising rates. Now, I will tell you, Danny, there are a lot of investors right now thinking that by next year, the Fed's going to have to be lowering rates again because the economy will be in contraction. That's going to be an interesting premise. We'll see how that happens to work out. It will. Well, step number seven, this is one that uh, you know everybody's hearing quite a bit about. In fact, if you turn on any major news outlet, you'll probably see a commercial with, with somebody on there you know, saying, hey, how good this asset is, and that's gold. And gold has historically, you know, in, in the past, been a fairly decent hedge against mm-hmm. inflation, against the markets, and it's been a non-correlated asset in, in many ways. Well, we're not seeing that right now. And in fact, everything's right. been trading, you know, kind of in unison or in tandem at the moment. Now, when we think about gold and the gold standard, that hedge may not still be there. I mean, we've owned it at different times within our own portfolios. Um, you know, not to say we won't go back to it and, and I own more of it. But at the moment, it hasn't been that place that, you know, it's been that safety asset that we've always thought of it as it was, right? Gold is fickle. Gold is a barnacle. It sticks to everything. It could be deflation. It could be inflation. Right. You have to remember, if you bought gold before 1980, or between 2002, 2013 was a great period to own gold, or say a small time in 2017. If you purchase gold outside those periods, you lost money relative to inflation. Now, emotionally, you might feel better because you know gold can't go to zero, right? There's going to be value there. But I don't want you to think that this is the great inflation fighter 
that it is. It goes through long cycles of really outperformance or underperformance. So you better be looking at holding this gold for a very, very long time. And you would think, Danny, that through this inflationary period, gold would have really worked out compared to the market, and it didn't. So you got to take the emotion out of it. You got to take the story out of gold and look at it for what it is. Yeah. It is not really the true solution to inflation. Well, and, and, and be mindful. Look, I know a lot of you guys out there probably love gold. It's, it's been a great I love place gold. for many p- people. I had to do my gold member impression. <laughs> But, you know, understand, you know, what part of the portfolio it's going to be your right. overall net worth. I right. think it's very, you know, you need to understand how you're go- going to own it. Uh, there's so many different ways is what's the price of the middleman? Um, you know, where are you going to store it? What's the cost of doing so? I mean, there's so many different ways to look at this. And we're not saying not to look at it and not saying that it can't come back in favor, which it can. But be mindful. Be mindful and understand it's not this panacea for safety. Right. right. So, it's, it's, it's just not. Um, yeah. Again, it's an, it could be a diversifier. You can use ETFs, right? They're backed by gold. You have more liquidity. Like as Danny said, I have people that will own a little bit of gold just because they say, okay, 2% of my liquid net worth is in gold. I hold coins or bullion, and I just like the fact that I have it and I can pass it on. So a lot of times people are using it even as a legacy asset, Danny. Correct. Yep. And that's fine because guess what? It might outperform through that legacy, right? Because it's not just yours. It might be for grandchildren. So this might be gold you hold for 50 years. So I understand that if you have a rule around it. But if you think that, you know, I'm putting everything into gold and people do get extreme, I think you're going to do yourself a disservice. Correct. But then, Danny, we get always asked. Oh my gosh, I savings bonds. They're all over the place. The series I. People it's just like talk- gold, right? Every article, everything <laughs> you see is about the I bonds. And listen, they are a true inflation hedge. I have a professor mentor of mine who has done this since they've come out. Now they've become sexy. That doesn't mean they're not going to work, but you got to keep in mind here are the pros and the cons. Purchases are very limited. You get 10,000 in I bonds each calendar year electronically, 5,000 paper, right? You can buy uh, paper I bond only. When filing a federal income tax return. If you get a tax refund, you can use those funds to go Correct. buy the paper. You can. They'll earn interest for 30 years unless you cash them first. You can cash them after one year. But remember, you gotta, I would tell you, if you cash them before five years, you're going to lose the previous three months of interest. So you got to look at these long term. Now, there's a fixed rate for the life of the bond and then an inflation rate. And that's set twice a year. And that's great because if you feel that inflation is going to be higher and who, whatever inflation is going to be, say it goes down to the Fed's magical target, like Mr. Powell is going to walk around with his little wand and make it happen, even though he's not. Though if CPI is 2%, you'll get 2%. At least you're going to keep up with the stated rate of inflation. But you got to remember these 8, 9, 10% rates of inflation go away and then you're back down to whatever it is, but you're still going to combat inflation. These are not available for retirement accounts and you have to open them through Treasury Direct. I will tell you, it's pretty easy to open an account through Treasury Direct. Um, Tax reporting of interest, I have a lot of people do this, Danny, they defer it until redemption or the final maturity. They don't want to uh, be taxed along the way. Federal income tax, obviously, you're going, to be, you're going to pay tax on it, but state and local tax exempt. So if you're in a state that has income tax and local tax, then you're okay. But again, limited, but they do work. And keep in mind with this is one of those deals where, you know, at the bottom and disclaimer, say past returns do not, you know, indicate <laughs> what future returns may be. That's the exact same thing here. So you're seeing the article saying, hey, yes. I bonds were getting six, seven, eight, nine percent That's great. But remember, that's what they've already... That's that number that was already locked in. So that doesn't mean what you're going to receive in the future as they update that uh, throughout the year. Now, I will tell you, you got to keep this in mind. I want you to think of Series I bonds as a baby. And the Treasury Inflation Protected Bonds or TIPS as the mama or the daddy, right? In other words, it's a different sort of animal, but yet related, okay? They're marketable securities, the principles adjusted for changes in CPI um, with inflation, say, you get a rise in the index, you're going to get a principal increase. With deflation, you're going to get a drop in the index and your principal decrease, okay? 
These are bought like you buy regular bonds through brokers, secondary market. At the maturity of a tip, you're going to receive the adjusted principal or the original principal, whichever is greater, right? You're not really going to lose money, right? This protects you against deflation because at maturity, you don't, if you put $1,000 in, you don't want to get $900 back. You're going to get that back. But if you're in a period of inflation, you're going to get that, your principal back plus interest. And these are available for 5, 10, and 30 years. You get semi-annual interest payments, inflation adjustments, and also an inflation adjustments that increase principal that are subject to federal tax in the year they occur. Here's what's important about TIPS. Because see, these are different than Series I. You can own these in your brokerage account. These are best, Danny, in tax-deferred accounts because there's that phantom interest I'm going to have to pay taxes on if it's in a brokerage. So these are perfect placement for retirement or tax-deferred accounts. But I'm going to tell you, based on future inflation expectation, these current yields are negative compared to traditional treasuries. And I don't think people understand that, Danny. You want to maybe talk about that a little bit? Well, I think that's an important thing to consider as far as how that works and as far as what expectations are. If we're seeing disinflation in the future where we still have inflation, but it's coming down, right? that's going to be, if we, we look at what you currently have, you could be in an environment where your, your, absolute, your real return is negative. And another thing I think we need to point out as well, a lot of people will access these types of instruments through an ETF or a mutual fund. And you don't have that same guarantee you were mentioning there, Rich, in the sense that you know, right now, if you go buy one of these, you may not see that decline in what your actual principal was. You just may not see a whole lot of interest. Right. But if you own that mutual fund or the ETF and you want to get out, it's really going to be contingent on where things are at that moment. And absolutely. Now, we'll tell you, Mike Leibowitz wrote a great, I, I, he, you know, you can call it an article, but I call it a guide to treasury inflation protected bonds. So go to Real Investment Advice, type in tips at top, take a look at that article that uh, Mike wrote. It's really thorough, Danny. Gives a real good overview of Series I versus TIPS. We wanted to give you the highlights of that so you understand. If I had to buy these today, if I had someone force me to make a decision, I would absolutely go for the Series I bonds versus the TIPS, Danny. Yep, because absolutely. Because inflation expect expectations are lower. We know that with older demographics, society's getting older, that's more deflationary. Over time, inflation will come down. I don't want to own these. I would rather own the Series I. That's right. So multiple ways to contact us. I know we've covered a lot of information today. We really appreciate you guys joining us. But Lance, sign up for Lance Roberts' uh, weekly newsletter. That's going to be every Saturday morning. That comes out. Uh, you go to realinvestmentadvice.com. We also send out daily market commentary. So uh, 7.30 Central, about every morning, it's going to come out, give you a lot of great, great information on what to prepare for for the day, what we're looking at, and just give you some information. Um, you can also go to our blog at realinvestmentadvice.com. And we've talked about that's a conveyor of information uh, consistently. New articles by Lance, Richard, Michael Leibowitz, uh, quite a few writers there. And really just deep diving into the data to tell you what it really means. You know, no sales pitch here, right? Mm -hmm. It's all going to be just the data, how we're looking at it, and what it should mean for you and your money. Also, tune in to The Real Investment Show. You can go to YouTube, uh, sign up there, Any any podcast outlet. Also, if you're in Houston, we're on AM 700, 6 a.m. each mm -hmm. morning. Uh, love to have you guys join us. Love for you guys to get on the YouTube channel. Richard and I, Lance, we're always uh, looking, seeing what you guys are talking about. Uh, chat room's great. Lots of information there, and we get a lot of good tips from you guys as well. So we're going to be doing more of these monthly lunch and learns. We do some very uh, defined topics. Yes. So if you have any questions, you can go to the ask a question at realinvestmentadvice.com. You can also go to our events tab, sign up for those. We'll do social security, uh, Medicare, long-term care, housing and retirement, investing in environments like this. Just a few topics that we cover, but in many, many more. I will tell you too, if there's a tip that you've been using and it works as far as battling inflation, by all means. Heck yeah. Send it to us. We'll use it on the radio show, our Financial Fitness Friday, if you tune in on Fridays. We want to share this with the community. So let us know. We're happy to help you with that. And by the way, we are fiduciaries. So we're here to help make sure that you know your interests are above our own. We have a cell discipline if you read the blog. And we have five certified financial planners, um, well-versed in every facet of the planning process. And that's Social Security, Medicare, tax-smart retirement income planning, 
Our job is to make you better That's and right. help you to understand how to navigate this crazy world. You know, Rich, I think one of the big things is not only just about the investing. We do invest a little different than most in the sense that we, you know, we'll underweight markets, we'll overweight them at different mm -hmm. times. We're a little more active uh, than the average buy and hold portfolio. But we're also very active when it comes to planning and keeping money in your pockets. So that's why for Rich and I, this is really important, uh, near and dear to our hearts in a sense that, you know, that's the other part of the equation. And if we can do a good job on that part, uh, minimize taxes, I think you guys are going to be in a great great position moving forward. I will tell you, buy and hold is buy and die. You buy and die and you sit there and you, you ride the cycle down. Yeah. You want to buy and stay alive, as I call it, doesn't mean you're not going to suffer losses, but we try to minimize the downside risk. And that's important to you in what I think, again, Danny, in the next 10 years, we're in for a tumultuous cycle and risk management is going to matter. And not only that, risk management in your financial plan, as we do it practically and realistically, is going to matter. So we appreciate you being here today for our Lunch and Learn. We hope you got a lot from it. And again, send us your tips, and we're happy to use them as well and share them with everybody else. Thanks again. Absolutely. And hey, don't forget, go to realinvestmentadvice.com. You have any questions you'd like to visit with somebody here at RIA, we'd love to visit with you. Everybody have a great week. We'll see you guys soon.